Hello, I'm Gurcharan Das. I'm an author and a former business person. I was CEO of Procter & Gamble India and then managing director, Procter & Gamble Worldwide for strategic planning before I quit at 50 to become a writer. And I've been a writer for the last 25 years, written many books, but known for this quartet of books called India Unbound, Difficulty of Being Good, Karma, The Riddle of Desire, and now the fourth one, which we are going to talk about, called Another Sort of Thing. Oh, I think it was uh, the second. It was I write because of, I have a problem, I, something troubles me. I wrote the first one, Artha, a book called India Unbound, or any person in our part of the world where there is poverty, every, you're bothered by poverty, poor. And so I wrote, I tried to find out the answers, and I wrote a book called India Unbound and it was the first book to predict the economic rise of India. So the India obliged by rising, but uh, I found that as prosperity was spreading, corruption was also spreading. So I decided to find out why. And so I went to the Mahabharat because I knew with Dharma, because one of the problems of corruption is Dharma. It's also governance, of course, but also dharma. And so I wrote the book, Difficulty of Being Good, which is an examination of our lives through the lens of the Mahabharat. The other problem I had, and I think everybody has, is desire. What to do with desire. And so I wrote a book called Karma, the Riddle of Desire. So each one was a project in self-cultivation, self-education. And then I discovered that I had written on already on the three goals of life. And so the fourth one was moksha. But I'm not a believer. I'm an, I'm, I'm an agnostic. I decided to actually write a memoir. My publishers, Penguin, for years had been asking me to write a memoir because they said, readers want to know yes. why you quit the corporate world at the top to become a, a writer. And so that's part of the story so, I tell. And I tell it through the story of connecting the dots in my life, connecting with moksha. Moksha means freedom. It has an original meaning of moksha, it has nothing to do with spiritual <laughs> meaning of moksha. Yes. And so that's the meaning that I have taken. Mm. And I have in the process discovered that these four goals of life are actually, you can, you fulfill these, these are potentialities, human capabilities. You fulfill, you fulfill the capabilities and you live a flourishing life. I used to believe that the secret of happiness was in one line, to love the work you do and to love the person you live with. That's happiness. But now, I feel that there's another definition of happiness, which is to fulfill your human capabilities. At the heart of the four books is this, you know what I've just uh, described, that it's, it's, a no, it's a common human search for happiness. So I have moved from a uh, one t very adequate definition of happiness to another definition of happiness. And as far as this latest book is concerned, it's called Another Sort of Freedom. In this other sort of freedom, what is that other sort of freedom? Which is that moksha? In my life, it is it is really a freedom from expectations. Expectations of your family, expectations of your friends, 
of society but most importantly expectations of yourself meaning that we all the expectation the ego you want to be somebody you don't want to be nobody and that desire to be somebody you you is part of the problem that all of us need to be somebody and if you get free from that need you are a better person yes. similarly uh we always all of us want premium treatment you walk in somewhere into an office or somewhere and you want to be treated in a in a good way so this constant need for premium treatment is another problem and usual other things that come with vanity with uh, envy status anxiety all these problems of the ego those if you can be free of those you have attained that other sort of freedom there is the personal freedom and then there is the public freedom in the public space and i as, and i'm a classical liberal and the classical liberal is a person who's open who's big hearted who's tolerant of others in his personal capacity but in public capacity the maximum equal freedom for everyone in society and therefore you need freedom of all kinds you need religious freedom you don't want the government to tell you that this is you should that you are a muslim or a christian and therefore they bind your freedom democracy gives you political freedom but most importantly there's economic freedom economic freedom is a freedom to do work from excessive control by the state now the intention of marx was good he wanted equality for everybody but the problem is that the e- human ego will not shrink that far and so the desire to give equality to everybody meant that only the state would be the employer so everybody became a civil servant whether you are a taxi driver or whether you are a guard in a shop or a shopkeeper everybody is an employee of the state now in theory that's good but in practice it's a disaster and that's what we that's why the soviet union collapsed and all the left all the countries of eastern europe collapsed 19 berlin wall 1989 was the end of that story i realized we have maoists ruling in uh, nepal but they are i think they are not uh, doctrinaire marxists who want to bring communism to nepal but the des- it's a the desire for equality is important but so is the desire for liberty ultimately you know the french revolution cry of the french yes, revolution yes. was liberty equality yes. and fraternity yes. now the western liberals have forgotten about fraternity that we operate in a community and in a community people are linked together there's too much individualism in amongst liberals and they forget that there is a interdependence of people also my life has been the, the reason why i call the book another sort of freedom is right from the beginning i have been i have been an odd ball and i've been taking decisions which went against the norm now to leave the corporate world at the peak of your career when you've been ceo and and so on 
in a multinational company seems like a stupid thing to do. When the retirement age was 65, I left at 50. But this process began very early. You know, my mother's diary, as which I quote in the chapter one, is that her first entry in her diary about me is that this is a restless baby. So at six months, I'm a restless baby. One year later, she calls me a difficult child. And then at the age of four, she calls me a troublemaker. You can, you can see the trend <laughs> that this is going on. And when I went to the university, I was lucky. I got a scholarship to Harvard to be an undergraduate. And my mother said, you should stud study something useful. You have to come back to India. You'll need a job. You have to make a living. And so she said, why don't you be an engineer like your father? you'll get a job. So I arrive at Harvard and I promptly forget her advice because I see the course catalog. And the catalog of courses says, and what do I study? In my first two years, I studied Greek tragedy, Russian novels. I study history of capitalism. Mm -hmm. I study the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. I study uh, Bauhaus architecture, Renaissance paintings, uh, Sanskrit love poetry. When my mother heard that I was studying Sanskrit at Harvard, she said, hi, hi, <laughs> dead language. Only the dead will now give him a job. <laughs> so this has been my life. And finally, I, you know, even Harvard got worried and I, had to declare a major in my third year. I declared uh, a con field of concentration. I got my degree in philosophy. And then I got another scholarship to go to Oxford to do a PhD. But then this, that summer, while waiting to do a PhD at home, I was back home in Chandigarh. I asked myself, did I want to really spend the rest of my life at that stratosphere of abstract thought no, I wanted a life of action. No, I didn't know what the life of action was, but I wrote to Oxford. I wasn't coming. And my mother's worst nightmare came true. She had a grown up unemployed son at home. And we had an, and she had a nosy neighbor who used to ask her every day, Thoda munda ki kar rahe? what is your son doing? And my mother would get embarrassed. And so to save her embarrassment, I answered the first advertisement in the paper that I found. And it was a company that made Vicks vapor rub for colds and coughs, balm. And so Vicks, and it, they wanted trainees, but I had no idea what a trainee was. I had studied philosophy. And so I went for an interview and the man asked me, and what is your objective in life? I said, happiness. He said, no, no. I mean, do you want marketing, finance, <laughs> uh, production? Which part of business do you want? I mean, it was clearly the interview went very badly. But the guy must have got impressed with my Harvard degree. So they gave me the job. And so I got a job for 750 rupees a month, which was a lot of money in the 1960s, this is 1963. My mother was satisfied and I was in a, I had, I was, I, I went from the beautiful ivy covered halls at Harvard uh, to the dusty bazaars of India, walking with my bag, asking a wholesaler, are kya lena hai? Ek dozen ke do dozen, you know, and so, it was a different life, but I liked the rough and tumble of the business life. But after a couple of years, I missed the intellectual life. Basically, I realized that Monday to Friday, and I could do my business life. But Saturday and Sunday was a multinational. 
nobody disturbed you on Saturday, Sunday. So I said, I'll be a, become a writer. And I told myself, it must be, and one morning I sat down and I said to myself, Shakespeare too must have sat down one morning to write Hamlet. <laughs> and so I, with the confidence of my 21 years, I wrote my first play. It won a big prize. It was published by Oxford University Press. It got produced in Bombay and then on BBC. And so, an Edinburgh Theatre Festival. So I had a second career. So I was wearing two hats. Monday to Friday hat, Saturday, Sunday hat. I was already, they had transferred me to New York, yeah. the company. So in New York, I looked for a producer and this person who produced my play, they converted it into her bhajans, Meera bhajans, into hard rock music. Wonderful. I had a second career uh, as a weekend writer. While my friends played golf, I, I wrote. And this is what kept on going, happening, until I was in my f late 40s. And I asked suddenly, you know, it, I, had, I was working for Procter & Gamble at the world headquarters. Quarters. Suddenly, you know, selling wicks, oil of ole, pampers, Tide detergents, aerial detergents, all good products. Pantene shampoos, yes. Gillette blades, yes. very good products. But I asked myself, is this what life is all about? And that's when I decided to quit because I said there must be a bigger world oh. outside. I was in a rising academic career, which I quit to become a business person. I had a rising business career and I quit to become a writer. We are not all born like Mozart, who at the age of three knew he was a musical genius. And at the age of five, he had produced a symphony. And then he died at 30 after having produced 625 great works of music. And those are unusual human beings. Most of us, find our purpose, we struggle. We struggle and we find our purpose. We stumble through life and we find our purpose as we stumble through life. And so that's how it is. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things I, I felt that once I quit the business world, I thought I would become a better human being, being a writer. But it hasn't worked out that way. I've been a writer for 25 years, had quite a lot of success as a writer, but I have not be become a better human being. You know, in fact, I've decided that actually business people are better human beings than writers, artists, and such. And why? Because business people n understand from day one interdependence. From they, they have customers. You can't be successful unless you have a customer. And the customer is happy. So you have to make the customer happy. Then you have suppliers. And if you don't, if you're not fair to your supplier, everybody tries to squeeze the supplier. If you're not fair, you'll get a bad component for your part, for your business, for your job, for your product, and you'll fail. Then you have employees. You can't do everything yourself. So you have employees and you have to treat them well. Because if you don't treat them well, they'll go and join your competitor. So therefore business people understand that you have to, you are interdependent. Which is which what they call win-win. That I have to win and the other person has to win. A writer needs nobody. You sit in a room and all day you sit and write and you, when you're writing, then of course you forget yourself. But when you forget, when you for, for stop writing, then you only have yourself yes, and you only think about it. The, you're quoting mm -hmm. from my book oh. where I talk about the difference between making a life and making a mm -hmm. living. And this idea came from the two influences in my life. Mm -hmm. My mother, 
who always reminded me I had to make a living, mm. and my father, who reminded me, who was more relaxed, and he said, you have to make a life. In fact, you know, when I described how at Harvard, mm. I went against my mother's advice, mm. I didn't study engineering. I studied nothing useful, according to her, it was all useless. But my father told her, ex explained to her, that I was making a life through books. And that's what he was the one who mentioned, told me when I was unhappy at business, that he said you should use your weekends, Saturday and Sunday, well, to make a life. And so that's the difference between making a life and making a living. And in fact, even at your job, you can make a life. You don't have to do it on the weekends. As long as it's something you're doing that gives you pleasure, that gives you purpose. I mean, you chaps are really on your way to making a life at your work. That's the best thing. So that's really what making a life is all about, is giving yourself purpose. And as I said, you stumble onto it. But truly, we are lucky because all species don't have those dreams is we have imagination. We have imagination and imagination is what gives us those uh, to dream something that you don't have. And, uh, and then you aspire to have it. And that's the source of a lot of civilization. The great, many of the great people who made great contributions, Einstein, Marx, Freud, Darwin, these human beings, they, they aspired to, now aspiring to reach the moon the, and so on. I think we, we, we learn it. I mean, it's, if you have Mozart, it's innate. But if you are an ordinary person, like myself, you, you keep learning. You, and you also get um, discontented. So far, I'm not discontented from my writing. And I think it is what you mentioned yourself. It's that ability to dream, the imagination of human beings. I think they're not, there's a lot of problems. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities with AI and technology presents. Of course, it's also scary what uh, AI can do. I am still optimistic. I think human beings have the ability to evolve. And we have learned to evolve because we cared for ourselves. Too much caring for yourself also makes you ego. The big fat ego <laughs> takes over. Mm -hmm. Human beings have enormous capacity. There have been periods when we practically wiped ourselves out also on, on the earth. The, in my view, the best thing that happened in this liberal age was globalization. Globalization allowed countries like China, the poor in China to get become middle class, and maybe not as many people, but the, Indi the, 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 the China did it as becoming the factory of the world. India did it by the back office of the world. For me, globalization was one of the big achievements of this liberal order. In fact, it's not the first time that globalization has occurred. It has occurred many times before. The last time was in the period from 1870 to 1900, before the First World War. That period was also a period of globalization. That was done under the British Empire. This was done again under the American success after the Second World War. So American Empire is, was the 
responsible for this. And globalization has meant millions of Chinese coming out of poverty because they became the factory of the world and millions of Indians who partly because of they, they, they have risen because of India becoming the back office. Now all countries are raising tariffs and they are closing down and that's bad. I mean economics one student knows that trade is a win-win situation not a win-lose situation. In inequality some people the one the guy with the biggest market share has the biggest money. money. And so he so there's inequality uh, and but the welfare state in many countries have has helped against inequality. It's not over. I mean I, I think it's a still symptoms are there of this the the geopolitical issue of course is the rise of China. The rise of China was all right until she became the head of Chinese yes. state. Yang Zemin, yes. Deng Xiaoping, they, they saved China. I mean Nepal is a very unusual position because it is between China and India. And actually Nepal should have used this opportunity of the last 25 years of the rise of China and India to link itself economically with both sides as a result of that. But somehow the trade, Nepal's ability to, it's a landlocked country, so it's difficult. But look, Switzerland did it. I'm Nepalese produce unique products. And these now with Amazon and so on, put them in the world market, getting distribution immediately. I guess the, there are these old fashioned values uh, it begins with discontent, a bit of discontent, but also uh, confidence. And also once you decide to do something, then you want to do it well, anything, whatever you do. So that's been another feature. Now these are old fashioned values, but ultimately if you're doing something that you like, but it has, one has stumbled through it. I liked for a while, the, I mean, I did like the rough and tumble of the business life, but then I, I like writing. You, if you're doing something that you like, you say, oh my God, it's already six o'clock. I thought it was four o'clock. So two hours you lost. Those two hours were the, was the period when you were totally absorbed. And that's how you know that you are really Time gets distorted is how you know that you are absorbed in something that you really like. You, you lose yourself. It's called self-forgetting. The Buddhists practice it, self-forgetting. You know the dedication of my new book, that another sort of freedom, that's again the same thing. The freedom that comes from not taking yourself too seriously. Dedication of my book is to the happy few who don't take themselves too seriously. In the Mahabharata, this is what uh, the Yaksha asks the question to Yudhishthir. What is the most miraculous thing in the world? He says this, you see people dying around you and you don't think you're going to ever die. I guess I'd like to be, we all, want somehow even after you die you you can live mm. and I hope that at least through my books and especially the difficulty of being good is the book that's been the best seller so what is that good human being is somebody who cares about another human being that's all it is and I have not achieved it <laughs> So, I won't be remembered for that, but I would aspire to be remembered for that. And when you get that sense of freedom, then that freedom also, because you realize, actually, that's what 
Buddhist philosophy mm-hmm. also teaches you that yourself is a hoax. It's, it's not doesn't there's no such thing mm-hmm. as the self. And so if you realize there's no such thing as self, then you might as well, you know, not be thinking about yourself all the time. That thinking about it means thinking about others.